I, uh, I decided to, to do the second talk. So in your literature, it says we're going to now talk. The first part was, what are these things? So we have a common language. The second part of the talk is, why do it? And I decided the best way to, to describe why doing it, instead of doing it abstractly, is to drop down in our neighboring city in the system that has the greatest relevance to us and look at how things are getting done there. And I did this as recently as de on December 30th, 2015, the second to last day of last year. <laughs> I spent a whole day and rode this system end to end, and I had a new iPhone, and I shot video and footage all through the system to show this sort of interface with the city, to show its use, who's on the train, how it's stopping, how fast it's going, and all that. So, uh, oh, by the way, this was uh, what we were planning in the 70s. You know, you see the dunes over there. See, we were looking people movers at that point. You know, we were ahead of the curve at this stage of the game. And then this is from a Seven magazine where they showed there's a UNLV and there's a, a train coming right by. That would be a, a nice image. And then there's the Valley Metro symbol. Uh, just a couple of seconds on my background, which I skipped on the first one I didn't bother doing, uh, is that I am an urban planner. I was an urban planning professor in uh, Virginia Tech in Alexandria. And the neat thing about being an urban planning professor is you get to go drop in on cities and spend a day there. And, take your iPhone out and enjoy, you know, looking at the, the, the people watching and the, the sort of, you know, the, the infrastructure investment. I'm now at the Greenspun College, and I'm, I think within uh, time I'm here, we'll have urban planning in the school, but I'm in public administration. So I say urban and public affairs. And I'm also at the Brookings Institution in Washington as a, as a senior fellow, and I'm directing this institute. And what's in this talk is a case study from the Phoenix Metro. Uh, a windshield survey. Now, a windshield survey means what it says it does. You literally go around and take things through a windshield. Now, why do you do that in planning? One of the interesting things about planning is you need to have some sense about how something's being used. You cannot just look at it abstractly as data, as statistics, remotely. Because there's the theory of doing light rail, and then there's the practice of doing light rail. Here's the really good news for Las Vegas. We don't have to have any theories of light rail. It's practically everywhere but here. <laughs> so the bad news is we're last. The good news is we're last. Because we don't have to make any mistakes whatsoever in the execution of the system. Because there's nothing, and so you know, people even say, how do you know this works? And my first question to them is, have you ever been anywhere but Las Vegas? <laughs> because if you have, you surely run into this. And if it doesn't work, why are they building it? Oh, they're building it because it's public money. It's there. Believe me, even if it's public money, you have a lot of pressure to do other forms of infrastructure investment if it wasn't practical. So the case for it is pretty manifest. I mean, you know, w uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, early, you know, Portland's and places like that, you had to make the case for it. If you were talking about this and it was 1995 in Las Vegas, or, or 2005 in Las Vegas even, you'd still be burdened with a kind of, we need to make a case for this. What about this? What about that? How about crime? Somebody's going to get on one of these systems, steal a television set with wires hanging off, <laughs> enter it, sit down in a security camera, and steal from your house. I'm going to suggest that's not a common thing. Because if you want to steal from somebody's house, do yourself a favor, get a car. That's why we should ban all roads. Most thieves use cars, so we need to ban all. They had these ridiculous discussions. In the last decade, and I won't mention any names, but this was under discussion in this valley. And this valley chose not to do it. And in that discussion, people said, I don't want it, because it bring crime. It's going to bring crime. And they said that in Scottsdale. They said that in Georgetown, in Washington. You go back to Scottsdale. You go back to Georgetown. You ask them, good call? No. What they say in Georgetown is, did you realize that the rent per square foot in the dorky parts of Arlington vastly exceeds ours? The commercial space is booming. Scottsdale, beautiful downtown. Tailor-made for light rail, walkable. But again, this ethos of, oh no, other people use that. Other people, yeah, other people, your customers use that. And so this stigma, even in these recent cases, has pushed the rail to places where people said, well, that's the urban part of town. 
I don't want it coming out here. But I don't, you know, I, and I remember Scottsdale had little hitching posts till recently, even do you remember being in downtown Scottsdale? You had Frank Lloyd Wright, you're selling hitching posts? You had the, the greatest American architect built in your city. I would make everything Frank Lloyd Wright-esque and, and be aggressively modern, and they, they have. And at one point in 06 when I was at ASU, I was a consultant and I was saying just that, but I was the 50th consultant to tell them that. But they did not take the rail. And they were, and they were proud, in 06 they told me, yeah, we did that, because you know crime. Crime, yeah, no, crime, <laughs> crime. Crime comes with rail, crime, you know, I said, yeah, what's your empirical evidence of that? They were like, I don't need any. I've seen the dirty cities <laughs> where they have rail and they look scary and funky people are on and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So uh, I also talk about cr traffic congestion, the link to economic development, and I think a version of the Phoenix system would work in Las Vegas. <laughs> and this video and, these fil and the filming was from that date I've just mentioned, the end of December, to show that streetscape, to show the urban land uses, also the flow of something like this. People want to know how fast is it? When I was writing a book called Boom Burbs, there was a mayor of Gilbert, Arizona in the middle of the last decade, last name Berman. And he said to me, you ever seen these light rail things? I said, uh, sure, they're all over the country. They're antique, they don't go very fast. No one wants to ride them because they're not quick enough. They don't move fast enough. They have, uh, they break down a lot, he told me too. I'm like, really? You know, because he's been on Metro in other cities and they have service problems and outages. But those are old, you know, if you're in Philadelphia or Chicago, these systems have, you know, bolts in them that were laid down by great, great grandparents in some cases. So yeah, they're gonna be a little cranky, but when you build these systems new, they work as, as smooth as can be. Uh, and just report out what you see and Urban planners are used to this method. So when I say this now and I show, look, there's this fancy way of doing it, because people think, what kind of field is this that you drive around and look at stuff? That's why I went in it. I'm that kind of guy. <laughs> to me, I, you know, I could do physics, but that's hard. Find me a field where you can just drive around and look out the window. So I'm, up to, I'm ready for that. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Also, the system is the most relevant to Las Vegas, and Phoenix is Las Vegas-like. We're a little denser than it. We actually have more opportunity to do it than they do. They have a little bit more of a challenge to do it than we do. If anything, our, our form, our space, our density, our intensity of land use, having an airport that has the second number of passengers leaving it. So Atlanta's a busier airport, but everybody's going somewhere else. If you're going to hell, you're going through Atlanta. You know that. <laughs> Just heads up, if you're dying, you're planning on dying today, you'll make a stop there. But you're not getting out of Atlanta. You get out at LAX, number one, you get out at our airport, number two, you get out at Orlando, number three. So, you know, we have an uh, airport that is unloading millions of people. And most of them, in, in the case of Phoenix, you're going all over. I'm going to Scottsdale at a resort, and they didn't build light rail there. I'm going, you know, here, the vast share are going to a very small space. It's linear, several miles long, but it's narrow, and it's discreet. It's, it's tailor-made for a linear system. So we actually have the most inexplicable, and people come and visit our city all the time. You know, we had the Secretary of Transportation most recently, the Mayor of Mesa, everybody's always said, I had to wait for an hour at your taxi stand. I'm looking at the hotel, why are you doing this? So we do have that opportunity, and, and you see this system under construction. I did a sabbatical semester in the spring of 2006, 10 years ago, when they were building this system and they were jackhammering outside the apartment I had at the Trillium at Rio Salado, just north of the town lake in, uh, in Tempe. And now that whole system is complete through there and they have offices and First Solar's headquarters are there and all that. But I want you to note, it is disruptive when you build it. Look at this. So it's not, a, it's not an unfair concern. So if the strip says, how messy is it when you're building it? Messy. How disruptive is it? Be honest, it is. There's ways to mitigate it, but the truth is you tear the whole street apart and you have to bring in all this heavy equipment and you have to put steel down. And even though once it's done, it looks like hardly any change has been made, the undergirding, the amount of concrete poured to hold the train weight and all that is part of the infrastructure cost. So it's not, and I can tell you from somebody who lived literally while they were building this system right next to it 
from my personal experience. I got lucky. I lived on the side of the complex away from it. There were people who lived right next to it. They told me they couldn't sleep. They were getting up at you know, six in the morning, but now that it's complete, it works a lot better. So I shot some video, and uh, I shot it along the Phoenix Innovation Corridor. And Phoenix finds that a lot of the firms that are <coughs> tech firms want this space along Central Ave, north of the downtown. And as some of this east of the downtown is kind of a biotech district east of the medical school in downtown Phoenix, this direction. But right through here, so you see the red arrows. This is where I start, Portland Street. This is where I end at Thomas Road. So three videos moving north, and I shoot these over the shoulder of the driver in real time at the front of the train. So you don't see the sideways view. You see the whole streetscape. All right. But first, I want to show you old school. This is, by the way, what it's going to look like when we're done with building it, <laughs> just like this. <laughs> I want you to notice something here. People are risk takers in the early <laughs> 20th century. They are, and they're being sold uh, extra software as they do it. Uh, look, at the, look at the interface right here. Look out! Whoa! Look, it, whoa, no, yes, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> there is no concept of a crosswalk. There is, and look at how common the trains are. They're coming one after another after another, single car. So from this video, <laughs> look out, you, you see the intimacy of a streetcar. People grab this thing on the street, call it, let it go. There was more minutes on that, but it's more of the same thing. I wanted you to see that because I want you to understand what an important contrast this is. In the early part of the 20th century, when these were developed, you didn't really have risk for fast-moving vehicles prior to the early 20th century. Nothing went very fast. Steam engines went fast, but they were completely segregated from you. In fact, they were banned from most cores of most cities. They were banned, lower, uh, lower Manhattan banned st steam engines. Because if you started and stopped them often, they blew up. So they could not be used for every half mile transit. So what you had is horse-drawn omnibus. Then you put that on rail and you had horse-drawn streetcar. Then you had cable systems where you had one common wheelhouse and a cable went under the track and what it does is it just grips it to move and you let go when you want to stop. Grip and let go. And it's still, you know, rarely found. San Francisco had it. People think that cable was there because they had hills. The biggest cable system was in Chicago and it's flat. Then somebody invented the light bulb. And the reason I say that is that was the killer category for electric generation. You couldn't have electrified streetcar until you had light bulbs because light bulbs became common and they were in every house and they paid for the construction of large generating stations. And then large generating stations had a complementary value in pushing streetcars. And who built the engines? Westinghouse. There is a streetcar museum depot in Paris, California. Not Paris, Paris. I'll always, you know, you know, you'll always have Paris. I'll always have Paris because Paris is the, the museum of every dead streetcar technology from Southern California. And they've let me walk through these dead streetcars. And the technology at the time is impressive. You know, the control systems, and it's all General Electric, Westinghouse. It's all the same people that brought you electricity, brought you electric streetcars. But until you had that scale, you couldn't get it. And that's the first time people started to say, well, then how do we use these? Right away, this is what happened. Did you see that street scene? New York City said, we have to build this underground. That's why the subway came about. Because you were stuck in traffic. At those, there is intersections, there's Chicago footage like this, where you're in the loop, you're dead stopped. So you had no priority, you had no, and you had no stations. There was no sense of a station, it was a streetcar. It literally moved down the street and you grabbed it. Now I want to show you going from downtown, at, starting at Portland Street, to Midtown. In, and this is over the, the bridge that's over that park, uh, Interstate 10 goes underneath. And you see a little Frank Lloyd Wright-esque Taliesin-like feature over there, because Phoenix gets it. Notice the speeds of the cars, but they get stuck at lights. You stop at a station, but you get priority on cross streets. You never get stuck for a light. Notice that nobody's jumping out in front of the train. <laughs> yeah. No, notice it's electrified up here. This is their arts district now. 
and uh, it's actually successful. I spent a little while on the arts district uh, going in the other direction. And you see the stations are pretty minimalist. It's not, you know, the building of uh, each one of our uh, stations for the monorail is, a, is an ordeal. These stations are pretty cheap to build. So that second video, I do three of these. So continuing along the same path, McDowell, you're leaving the arts district, you're gonna come upon the Heard Museum. Note the, you know, this is run through a corridor of mixed-use commercial. It's mostly not housing. Uh, there is some housing. In fact, uh, there's some early housing that predated this that pops up on the left uh, along Thomas and along, uh, you know, Portland Street had some housing. This is some housing right over here, for example. But it's a lot of office commercial and institutional use like herd. So you see you're keeping pace. A car's going faster, but they might make a minute at a light, too. And you might pick up passengers, but you're not going to wait at a light. The driver was a good guy. He didn't care I did this. By the way, thank you, Phoenix Metro. So this isn't the busiest day. It's the day before New Year's. But there was still a lot of traffic in parts of the system. And then the last video I want to show you, just getting to Midtown. So you see the kind of urban space they're building through. It's not as intensely developed as the Strip, but it's not, you know, suburban either. Although it ends of the system, it is, and I'll show you some photos of that. And you see a lot of signage along the way of what's coming. See this? That's coming. Big buildings are coming. And big buildings are being built. And I'll show you other parts of the system of that Strip. So you end up, and uh, I stayed at that Hilton Suites that's over here, parked my car in Phoenix, and was there for a whole day and never moved my car, because you can do that in Phoenix. Approaching station, Thomas and Central Avenue, Midtown, exit to left. And I looked at the vacancies along here. These buildings were built in the late 80s and fell into the savings and loan crisis and they were excessive space for the Phoenix uh, metropolitan market. And even after that, they weren't the sexiest office buildings. Now what I find is that they are packed because they have access to this system. So not only does it build new real estate, it captures and fortifies the investment in older structures. It cr increases rents, it increases occupancy. And I know that development well because I've been in Phoenix over many, many years. And I've stayed in that hotel, I think, the first time in the late 1980s. And I remember at one point in the early 90s, they were giving that hotel away for $29 a night because, and on a free breakfast because they just, it didn't cost anybody anything because all the investors that had put money into it didn't owe the SNLs anything because the SNLs needed to be bailed out. So before the financial crisis of 08, the biggest dip in real estate was that. And Phoenix had a lot of real estate built along that corridor and in other parts of town that reflected that, that boom in the 80s and then got caught. And the good news for them is a lot of that's now secure because it's in this system. It's, it's with rail. So what you see on the, st on the track is housing everywhere. And I caught a few glimpses out windows like that. Uh, the amount of vacant space along the system is evaporating. The land costs and bid rents of, along that reflect the fact that it's going for higher and better use. And that, not mostly high rises mostly multifamily, lower slung structures like this, some high rises. You see, I got even a little bit of, clean those windows, Phoenix. We're gonna do a cleaner system. We're gonna make sure we squeegee all the windows. But everywhere, and you know, almost all of it, by the way, notice, is desert modern. There's no, you know, sort of mission restored sort of space on these. It's all the, the, the next Phoenix. You also see the offices like Thomas Road, and there's uh, the, state, the train coming in. You see dorms and hotels. This is a big uh, uh, Ramada Inn or a residence inn. This is uh, the headquarters for First Solar, and it was going to be 2016, so they changed all their louvers over to that. This is downtown Tempe coming into the station, and that's an, an ASU dorm. And what you see is the interface with other connection points. So this is the magic staircase to the SkyTrain at 44th Street. So Phoenix has rail linked. So if you fly in the Sky Harbor and you don't want to take a taxi, there's a free train, it's paid for by landing fees at the airport, to the metro at 44th, and you can get on it, and you could stay in the hotel. If I flew to Phoenix, I didn't need a car either. 
for where I stayed. So all of Tempe, you don't need a car, downtown Tempe, all that. The whole corridor, the downtown, heading north, you don't need a car. And if you do need a car, you park and ride. And this is the one at the Mesa station, and this is the one north and west in central Phoenix. And you can see you're in a kind of lower density environment at the ends than you are at the core of the system. So who did I meet on the train? Uh, a lot of millennials were on the train, and a lot of them had bikes, and a lot of them were listening to music and not talking to anybody. Yeah. So it was hard to, it's hard to get them chatty. So, you know, when you do a windshield survey and you're on public transit, one of the things you do is you just, you know, you chat people up. And the millennials are not chatty. <laughs> but they are not. They're in a world of their own. They're like, I didn't even want to break in because they were grooving to something. And they probably don't use that language either. But they were, you know, uh, and they had a bike and they had all this sort of, you know, accoutrement of young adulthood of which I barely grasp at this stage. But I'm um, getting closer to these guys, so this was easier. What was fun is there were a lot of bowl games that week in Phoenix. And people were visiting friends who had permanent houses in places like East Mesa, coming from the Midwest, complaining it wasn't as warm as they hoped it would be, because it was a kind of a chilly week that week. And talking about how much better it is to jump on this thing than go into the scariness of downtown Phoenix, when you start to lose skills at driving, you know, the first cities you give up are like New York and San Francisco. You may have never gotten to New York and San Francisco in driving skills to begin with, but let's say you had driving skills. Then, you know, you start to feel comfortable more and more in a, you know, an anthem, but don't want to go to the strip. And you feel comfortable in those master plan communities that are, you know, senior housing, that are age-restricted housing around Phoenix but you don't want to go to the strip. One of the advantages is you could just park at a parking ride, go in, and they were going to bowl games. And one of them was at Chase Field. And they were, it wasn't even the day they were going, they were just testing to see how long it would take, they were gonna eat lunch down there, they were gonna do some shopping, and they were saying, you know, where are you from? And I said, Las Vegas. They said, you should build one of these there. Because <laughs> if you did, I'd love to get on it. I'd love to go down the strip, I'd like to not need a cab, I'd like to not, I'd never drive. It's crazy there. People will run you off the road, they said. Uh, it's even worse than Phoenix. Uh, apparently we have an unsavory reputation in that regard. I don't believe that's true. I've been in Washington. I know what it's like when the diplomatic corps is given licenses within the United States, but no accountability because they could be whisked off to some other country and they have dominion over themselves as they drive around streets and crash into your vehicle. Uh, so, but they are convinced that Phoenix is scary. And then a lot of park and ride commuters. And even on that day before, uh, you know, New Year's, there is a large hospital downtown. There were nurses in uniform, and I talked to one of them. They hate parking there, it's expensive. They gave them passes so that they had subsidy, and they park and ride up top, and they just jump in their cars, and the thing comes so frequently, they said, what a convenience this is. I don't know any of us that are driving down there anymore. What's good is when your workforce, when your tourists, when your students are not using the system, are not using cars, rather, and are using the system, you've got the, the workings of a successful system that's doing multimodal choice. In other words, people who want to use it, use it. The people who are on the road have less cars to contend with. There's less congestion as a consequence of it. It's a win-win because, you know, there are always people in Washington that even say when they built the, the train all the way out to Dulles Airport, which they're under construction to rest in now, and they're through Tyson's, they say to me, I'm never gonna use it, but I hope somebody else does. And that means there's less people in front of me. And there's that kind of ethos with a lot of these people who aren't, the people of commuters not jumping onto the thing are somewhere happier in a car as a consequence. Now let's look at congestion here. Let's turn to Las Vegas again. Uh, what are the forces limiting us? Well, you can see. If this was a train, this would be a much clearer corridor, obviously. And I don't think that our airport's constraining us, our number of rooms, the convention space. I think that actually the greatest single vulnerability to our success as a tourist economy, and it's just as a successful, functioning, efficient metropolitan area, is that we don't have any alternative to cars. And most of the cars are occupied by single drivers. And they take up this kind of space all around the city. And you know, this is just a work a day, you know, coming off TROP here, but we're, we didn't have a stadium here yet. And we're gonna build more such things. Now, this is just street forms around the world. You see that there's different bones of cities. This is Midtown Manhattan, for example. And what you have in Midtown is a great grid. 
you have, and you have a sort of modified grid in San Francisco to reflect some of the urban form, and you have these older cities that are difficult to navigate. But a lot of the US and a lot of even sort of Canada built these sort of rational streetscapes. So, you know, there's old parts of Boston that have reflect the kind of colonial planning style. But by the early 19th century, the US switched to the New York style efficiency. Philadelphia has this model and so on. The reason I raise this is that we are partly in that system. Oh, this is just another one of those shots with uh, people in cars versus transit. We are partly under that system here, but we also have what are called super blocks. So we have blocks, and this is just a, you know, if you do everything in a cul-de-sac versus a grid structure. We have blocks by the convention center that have <coughs> no grid structure left in them. So one of our problems isn't just that we have a lack of transit option. The other problem is that we built really big resorts, and each of them is an island that has to be driven around. Now, the good news is we built big resorts. The good news for conventions is that we have 9 million square feet of convention space, and most of it is in the basements of hotels whose gaming floors were so big that any one of those basements is bigger than Pittsburgh's convention center. So Caesar's Palace is bigger than Pittsburgh's convention center. You know, uh, the Mirage is bigger than Pittsburgh's convention center, and so on. So decent-sized cities like a Pittsburgh or a Cleveland have convention space, even though they have two million people, and we have two million people. They have more than us. They have over two million. You know, two-plus million in St. Louis. They have, but they don't have anything we have because each hotel is itself a standalone mini city. Now, that's great because if you're seeking a resort experience and you want the totality of a resort, you want the pools integrated and you want gaming and entertainment and food integrated, and you want to do a conference there. All this works. Where doesn't it work? It doesn't work when you're trying to build streets through it. And we have a challenge in that there's even remaining things like, oh, I don't know, a giant golf course. All of this was fine in the strip of the 1960s, 70s, 80s. But by the late 80s, in the new era, starting with the Mirage, when we built these super resorts, we are doing ourselves a sort of challenge, if you will, we're doing ourselves a, a disservice, in that we haven't ever made the shift to say, okay, what is the street form that needs to support a large hotel? Because I wouldn't say, hey, let's not build large hotels, because the whole economy is large hotels. And large hotels have a physical reality of taking up an enormous urban footprint that has to be navigated around. There's just a simple reality of that structure. But what we haven't done, and what we can still do, because we can retrofit it, is we could say, what are the street structure requirements and grid-like interchange that allow you to work backwards around that? And I'll tell you why. Because if you go back to the slide on New York City right here, and you look at this, Midtown Manhattan is a mess. But what you have is options. If you don't like the way streets are flowing, make a right. If you don't like that street, make a left. And enough people do that and make independent decisions so that there is a diffusion of traffic across a vast space. So Manhattan couldn't work as Las Vegas. Las Vegas can't work as Las Vegas, so Manhattan certainly couldn't work as Las Vegas. <laughs> so that's the problem. Plus, they've got trains running all under this. So Midtown has trains and it has a grid, and we don't have either one of those things. We've got this. We don't have this. We don't have people. We've got cars. This is just 60 cars versus 60 people. And this is one little lonely bus against that. So we don't have, we have mega blocks. We have malls and, and we have uh, large hotels rather. We, you know, in the rest of the world, a mall takes up a super block. Our whole city is a series of super blocks. And you see the super blocks right here. And the worst <coughs> thing is, this is our convention center and the whole east side of the strip is a series of super blocks. So not only do you have no alternate for transit, not only do you have heavy demand because we have the largest conventions, and when we go to peak conventions like consumer electronics, you're on a street that was intended for much lower load of traffic and doesn't have any alternatives. It's got the monorail, and thank God, because it would be worse without it. The monorail is actually taking some relief off this, but we need more than that, and we need surface transportation to reflect that. So here's the problem. If a street system is not designed to carry high load, and it doesn't have multiple diffusion points, if you add density, you have a greater increment of traffic congestion for the density. 
it's not normal. It's every time you go with greater density, and density represents hotels that have 4,000 rooms, 3,000 rooms, 2,500 rooms, and so on. If a street system in an urbanizing space is not supported by rail transit, every increment of new density will add a greater increment of traffic congestion. Midtown Manhattan versus the Las Vegas Strip, New York can handle it. So people say to me, the most people I've ever seen as pedestrians are 42nd Street and Trop and Las Vegas Boulevard, or Flamingo and Las Vegas Boulevard. Those are the two greatest concentrations of pedestrians I have ever seen in my life in the United States. In fact, people are surprised the extent to which there is a pedestrian orientation on the Strip. It's one of the shocks. If you've never been to the Strip, you imagine that it's a much lower density, much more sprawling affair than it's been built into, which is a much higher density, much more intensely urban affair, and you're shocked that you're standing you know, shoulder to shoulder like you would be in Midtown Manhattan, but there is a critical difference. Midtown Manhattan does that more efficiently because it has both a street structure and a transit overlay, in the case underlay, because it's mostly subway, that allows it to get away with those densities. So when you look at <coughs> Midtown Manhattan and you look at 42nd Street, how many people were delivered there by car is very different than the Strip. What we have is parking decks bigger than buildings in some other cities, and the entire back part of <coughs> both sides of the Strip, Koval or you know, Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra, all these sort of, if you're named for a star, you're not the sexiest street in Las Vegas. <laughs> you're a work a day, you know, you're a, you're a worker street, you know, in, in Las Vegas. Those streets, those decks are deflecting an enormous amount of pressure, but they're also a contortion because what they're doing then is if you have to get mobility outside that corridor, get to the convention center, good luck to you. So what could we do in the Consumer Electronics Show? We could do 200,000, 250,000. They'd all be paying customers. They'd all be spending money. Why can't we go to those numbers? Some of it's some of the other mechanics of space, but mostly it's you wouldn't be able to move. And so if we don't clean this up, Orlando's saying, we're going to make you move. We're going to go at Las Vegas' business model that way. So what can you do? You can reprogram the traffic lights and get a little, and that doesn't cost much. You can widen intersections, get more turn lane capacity. You see that all around. That does reduce some congestion. Breaking up the super blocks is expensive, but cutting relief streets out of the east side of the Strip. So if Wynn wants to do something big, urban, wants to take the, say, the golf course and put in more convention space and do mixed use and do multi-purpose, that is an opportunity for the city, you know, for the county to come in and do a kind of street system plan in cooperation with the hotels, because it's private space, that, that takes relief off some of this. And it's to the tune of $100 million or more. But the most important thing you could do is construct an integrated rail system that links key assets, because that's the only way to expand capacity. So <coughs> most cities, when they do rail, the benefits for the rail are bigger for real estate investment and attracting millennials. Here's what's different in Las Vegas. We actually benefit from congestion straight up. That's the difference. So, because the, the manifest purpose, the stated purpose of transit typically to the engineers is, you need to do it because too many people are in cars. And then people come along and say, you know, we've looked at cities like a Phoenix. Not a lot of people have left their cars. And they, then you turn to, well, you know what it did though? Central Ave used to be a boring, dorky backwater. Now it's the innovation district. Now it's got all these, you know, tech firms and arts districts and museums and all this is linked together and you're attracting a different workforce. So that's the sort of backup notion, the economic value. There's also an environmental value to it, you're reducing carbon emission and all that. But the first point of all this is typically, you know, why did New York City build a uh, subway system? It wasn't, it was congestion relief. It wasn't, wow, we need to do real estate development off the subway system. They, they figured that out later on, but it wasn't the manifest purpose. We're building for that purpose. Our manifest purpose of this, and that's why there is a commission, that's why Tina's on this commission, that's why they've just rolled out an enormous plan that's quite impressive and I'm very supportive of, and I think everybody should be supportive of. The reason is simple. We actually just need this straight up. Then we get the benefits. We're a twofer. You know, Phoenix, did it need it? Yeah, some. Could it use it? Certainly. I think it's a vast improvement. I think Phoenix is a better city and getting better every day as a consequence of having not just world-class suburbs like Paradise Valley, but also having a place for somebody to live there if they choose to live in multifamily and not be reliant exclusively on private transportation. All that's great. All that's good. Vegas needs it because Orlando's doing it and we're not. Straight up. They're going to kill us. 
They're going to beat us because they're going to get people to conventions and they're going to take conventions away. They have six million square feet of space, by the way. Why? Because every large hotel there, which is replications of theme parks, basically, but has big footprints, the Dolphin has 300,000. You know, all these hotels in and around Disney are like our resorts, and they're near their convention center, and you can program enormous conferences. Right now, they, the biggest thing they got is plastics. What do they want? They want the Consumer Electronics Show. So, and what do they go after? The rodeo. What are they going after? Our events. They're going after conventions, events, and what they're doing is they're building the infrastructure necessary for mobility, and they see it that way. So the biggest metros in the Mountain West, all of our competitors have these systems as I mentioned previously, and they're all building more of it. And they all have their airports linked. And this is just a quick map to show this single disconnect, again, could be completed down here. But notice how close, preciously close it was to the airport. There's even a little plane. If I flew to this, if I went to this city, the first, and I had no knowledge of Las Vegas, I came from Beijing, all right, where they have everything multimodal integrated. And I flew to this city, and they handed me this map. The first question I'd say is, but, 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 why? Why this? You know, and I'd, you'd have to say, well, there was this taxi cab commission. And then there was this, and then, and then this happened, and then that, unex and then this one said they didn't want it in their property. And that one said, and they don't do that stuff in other cities. What they do is they build it to the airport. They build it to the airport as fast as they can get it to the airport. And the reason they do is that airports are bottlenecks. And solving the congestion in a bottleneck and reducing friction of movement is the heart of economic development when it comes to people moving and tourism. And that's our main business. I mean, we could suffer with congestion if our business was inventing stuff. <coughs> the leading export of the San Francisco Bay Area is royalties owed to the region for its invention. It's the largest foreign exchange for San Francisco. So in San Francisco, it's not a product. The well, largest foreign exchange for LA is intellectual property paid on bad TV, okay? The biggest one in San Francisco is for, you know, iPhones and for patents and all that. They can sit around in a congested region and it wouldn't really affect their economy. It might affect some of their exchange points in terms of, you know, creating these business environments. But for us, it's deadly. So another quick look at the, the strip again. In that context, all of this disconnect has to be connected. Maryland Parkway over here has to be connected. The strip has to be connected to North Las Vegas and Henderson. And we have four non-integrated systems. So other big picture just to end with this, and I'm gonna take Q&A right after this. Economic development. So congestion's a problem, but if you look at Phoenix where they estimated just about a billion along their light rail system, they actually have seen about seven billion in estimates for construction. Again, that doesn't include the fact that stuff that used to be lower rent went higher rent and can pay more taxes and has a higher tax increment. And along that rail line, this is what you see. Cranes and dirt and signs of future stuff. And again, Phoenix developed this system and it opened into the heart of the Great Recession. So they opened this system up and the country has just gone through the worst economic downturn it has known since the Great Depression. Yet. Phoenix has one thing that keeps going. The investment around this system is almost unbroken because it's a new category of investment. It's not the next subdivision. It's not, you know, let's get the BLM to give us some land so we can put some more houses on it. It's in their existing space and it's remaking their existing space. So beyond the construction, you have this tech corridor. And the fact is that there are certain firms that seek multi, that seek locations that have multi-dimensional space that have transit, that have walkability. And for example, First Solar has got its own stop on the, uh, the light rail. Why? Who works at First Solar? People that like solar. People that like solar want to save energy. People that want to save energy want these systems and they want walkability and they want this lifestyle. So we're right now, you know, we were one of the bidders, just to give you how tangible this is for us. We were one of the bidders for uh, a branch of the patent office out of Washington, DC. Turns out a lot of patents in the US are West, with San Francisco being a lot of it. So the patent office in its infinite wisdom said, we gotta get out of Washington. We're gonna move an office West and, they were very, and we can't go to San Francisco because it costs a million billion dollars for one square inch of San Francisco. <laughs> so here are these other cities. And you know, we're in there, Denver's in there. And the people who work in the patent office work within steps of that VRE stop in Alexandria, Virginia, I showed you, in an enormous complex called the Carlisle. Mixed use, 
uh, mixed tenure, owner housing, renter housing, you know, retail space, restaurants, office, commercial, private, law firms that are patent law firms, in an enormous complex tied between two metro stops and a VRE stop, purposely. So when they asked the folks who are going to be sent packing to the Great West, because some of the staff, they you know, Washington doesn't want to start a whole new office out of new employees and, you know, have to answer questions during debates for that sort of action. They say, well, I'm going to take some of the staff and you're going to work out West. But we're not going to, we're going to get your input. We're not going to just move you. Where do you want to go? I want to go to this rail. Why? I use rail now. I don't want to go from rail to no rail. Who won? Denver. Where is it? Right near their main station. Right near where their Union Station integrates regional rail and light rail. And we were never in the game. And the point is, with this kind of workforce, we're never going to get in the game. These are, by the way, students going to a graduation. It's a publicity shot for ASU on the light rail. And there are students graduating out of these cohorts right now, in our cohorts, that just can't understand why a place wouldn't have this capacity. And they will go and seek out places that have this capacity. So with that, I'll do Q&A. And uh, just raise your hand. We've got a mic for you. And I could do it for both talks. So thank you. <laughs>